My name's Hannah Begbie. I'm an author and I am here to interview the award-winning, best-selling novelist and screenwriter David Nichols. David is the author of five best-selling novels. His third, One Day, published in 2009, was a love story that made us both laugh and cry and went on to sell millions of copies at the bookshop and millions of dollars at the box office after David himself adapted it as a feature film starring Anne Hathaway and Jim Sturgis. His most recent novel, Sweet Sorrow, has just come out in paperback and has attracted justifiably glowing reviews, including The Independence, Just Gorgeous on the Bits of Being a Teenager, An Utterly Heartfelt Tale, and The Telegraph's A Pitch Perfect Romance. His fourth novel, Us, was long listed for the Booker Prize. He went on to adapt it as a drama for the BBC, starring Tom Hollander and Saskia Reeves, which will be coming to our screens later this year. His extensive list of screenwriting credits includes Cold Feet for ITV and an adaptation of Far From the Madding Crowd into a movie starring Kerry Mulligan and Patrick Melrose, his adaptations of the novels of Edward St. Aubyn for Sky Atlantic starring Benedict Cumberbatch, which rightfully earned David many awards, including a BAFTA win and an Emmy nomination. It is one of the best pieces of television drama I think I have ever seen. Welcome to the Great Big Book Club, David Nichols. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, I have got so many questions for you. I want to talk to you about um, the recent paperback release of Sweet Sorrow, and I really want to talk to you about the adaptation of Us. Sure. But first of all, since we last met in November last year when the hardback came out, yeah. um, we've been thrown into the grips of a global pandemic. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what has been a typical day for you in the height of lockdown? Well, um, I realized how much my uh, working days revolve around school terms. You know, that's when I work and having the kids around all the time means that I haven't really done very much. I've sort of supervised their getting up and when during homeschooling, make sure that they were working and I've done a lot of cooking. Um, I've tried to read, constantly distracted, but I, ha I, I everything except writing really. I got very into, um, obsessed really with cycling and cycling around the empty city. A lot of kind of long, slightly post-apocalyptic bike rides um, and a lot of time trying just to have, uh, get the kids engaged with something other than their phones, uh, but very little work. So it's been fine, it's been, you know, comfortable, boring, uh, occasionally incredibly stressful and worrying, but it's been okay, just not very productive. Do you feel like the process of cycling around the city and having a think might at some point weave itself into one of your books or screenplays? Maybe, I'm quite interested in, I mean, this isn't, I have to be careful what I say here because it's, it's, it, it's been, generally speaking, pretty amiable within the family, but it's made me crave solitude. You know, I love being in a room. I finally got back into my office and I love being in a room by myself. It's thrilling. It's really exciting to have that space. And even though we've got on very well, um, I've, I've, the times that I've really remembered are the times where I've gone for long walks and spent time in solitude and maybe I'll write about that as some kind of enforced isolation or, or, or escape. I don't know. Mm. Escape is the wrong word. I, I just have found that I've craved the countryside in particular, especially at that time when we couldn't travel. So I'd love to write a, a, something that isn't uh, urban, something that's more rural, uh, because that has been a great, not solace, but a great escape for me over the last six months. Well, should we talk about the uh, setting to Sweet Sorrow? Yeah. So, this was the hardback released yep. last year, uh, and this is the very beautiful paperback which came out two months ago. That's right, yeah. So, David, will you tell us a bit about the story? Sure. Sweet Sorrow is a classic coming-of-age love story. Um, I wanted to write about first love and that extraordinary experience of all these new emotions and, and, and how intense life can 
feel at that time of 1617, uh, both in a wonderful way, meeting new people and falling in love, and also the fears and anxieties of being that age. So it's about a kid called Charlie who's just left school um, without qualifications. He's not sure what he's going to do. And he meets a girl, desperately wants to see her again and spend time with her. But the huge obstacle is that she's appearing in a play, an amateur production of Romeo and Juliet. And Charlie is horrified at the idea of <laughs> taking part, but it's the only way he can see her. So they make a deal. He does the play, they spend time together. She'll teach him how to perform, play the part of Benvolio. And it's a romantic comedy set over the course of one summer, a kind of three act comedy set in June, July and August, uh, sorry, yes, June, July and August of 1997. So it's someone looking back at this golden summer that changed their life. Uh, one of the things, David, that I love about uh, reviewing your books and your uh, film and television is looking at uh, how themes uh, re-emerge across your yeah. work um, and how they change through, uh, through the course of your writing. And acting is something that comes up a lot. Thought is ambition and acting yeah. comes up a lot in the understudy, comes up in one day. And obviously Sweet Sorrow, this Shakespeare play is the backdrop for this burgeoning romance between Charlie and Fran. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that acting played in your life and how it led to a decision to write? What's strange about it is it didn't really come from a great love of theatre. I, I, I don't particularly go to the theatre very often. I often do it rather grumpily. But what I, what I did love was being in a play and the business of putting on a production and the kind of camaraderie of it. And I wanted to get that into, I'd always wanted to put that into a novel, the intensity, the kind of self importance of it, as well as the kind of um, the fun and the, uh, the comedy of it as well. And I, those experiences of being in an amateur productions were really formative for me not so much as an actor, but very much as a writer. You know, I learned so much about writing from the business of putting on a play, seeing people uh, create characters, seeing how stories work, seeing how jokes work, seeing how performance and dialogue combine. Um, that was a big part of my education as a writer. And I suppose um, for me also the great thing about it is when I was younger, when I was Charlie's age in the book, unlike Charlie, I loved books and film and television. I was obsessed with them. And I didn't know anyone who worked in those fields. You know, I didn't know anyone who worked in publishing or film or TV. So for me, being in a play was a way of staying involved in the world of writing, of creating stories. And um, that's why I kind of clung to it, really. That's why it was important to me. It was a way for me to be, um, it was a creative outlet, even though I didn't go to the theatre until my 20s. I, you know, I was doing all these plays, um, but without ever really seeing uh, a show and apart from, um, you know, school productions. But it was definitely part of my love for the written word, the performed word, um, the way actors create roles and the way stories are um, created. So it was a, Sorry. A Sorry, yeah, a big part of my kind of cultural education, while at the same time I wouldn't call myself a huge theatre fan. They're just speaking as an ex-agent, I think there's a really uh, interesting, the, the interesting element of control, that when you are an actor, quite often you are at the whims and mercies of other people's decisions, aren't you? And then you go into the process of writing, particularly writing a novel where everything is to all intents and purposes under your control and you are the puppeteer, aren't you? Did you, was there something in your personality that also drew you more to that kind of process of novel writing where you were able to kind of just keep a world under your fingertips as it were? I mean, I think I didn't really have the confidence to call myself a writer all that time. Whereas, you know, when you're part of a company, you're part of an ensemble and you're, you're chipping in, um, one of the really formative experiences in my acting career was understudying in the production of, uh, the first production of Tom Stoppard's Arcadia. And sitting in the rehearsals, when you're an understudy at the National Theatre, you're in all the rehearsals. So over the course of eight weeks seeing this play come together and watching, obviously being very impressed by the presence of the playwright in the room, 
but also gradually realizing that that was the best job, really. That was by far the, the most exciting role. The ability to come in uh, with a, a new page of dialogue and say, try this, was really exciting, but required a kind of confidence that I didn't get told much later. And I feel the same about writing fiction. You know, it's, it, it felt almost pertinent to me to say to people, would you mind reading this 200, 300 page novel? So it did take a little while, but yes, something that is, 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 is exciting about it is you, much more than screenwriting, the opportunity to present your work and your view of the world, to say what you want to say. You know, these are literally your words. Whereas with acting and to a lesser degree with screenwriting, you're part of a team, you're part of an ensemble, and the version in your head isn't necessarily going to be what ends up on the stage or on the screen. So yeah, the mad power of writing fiction is very appealing. Uh, screenwriting is something I really want to come back to because I, it's so fascinating that you have such a command of both the uh, process of novel writing adapting your own work and adapting other people's work and that great command you have over these two very different disciplines um but just before we come to that i mm. want to just talk to you about this other theme that is so fascinating that recurs in lots of your work which is about parental relationship yeah. um, obviously sweet sorrow the relationship between charlie and his dad um is incredibly poignant and um Charlie brings a lot of um, this resentment there, isn't there, and anxiety, and there's hope, and there's despair. And I find that you often write about parental relationships with such, um, such feeling and such emotion and such depth that happens uh, in us between De in uh, one day between Dexter and his mum, us, obviously. Um, and I wanted to just know what it, what is it that keeps you coming back to that as a subject, both in terms of your adaptation of other people's work, because Patrick Melrose was a tour de force of that subject, but also yeah. your own work. What is it that really interests you in that dynamic? I don't know. I think it's probably, uh, it's hard to know how frank to be about this, but I, you know, both Sweet Sorrow and Us were written in the shadow of my father's illness and death and like a, a, you know, I'm at a particular age, a time in my life where I think a lot about that relationship. You know, I'm a parent myself. A, a lot of parenting is done uh, in the shadow of one's parents and in contrast to one's parents. And, and I've thought a lot about, you know, how my relationship with my son differs from my relationship with my father and, and what remains common. So it's something that I'm preoccupied uh, with and certainly have been in the in the time since my dad died uh, and it's probably also tied up with a certain amount of sadness and regret really it wasn't I mean it's no secret to say that it was it was a quite a difficult relationship not in a Patrick Malrose way I mean my father was was very different from all of the fathers I've written uh, but it was always a very self-conscious slightly distant, awkward relationship. And um, when I started writing, I was very wary of writing about family, very wary of writing about parents and children. And uh, they're, they're very much in the background. Um, even in one day, you know, Emma has barely has a relationship with her family. She doesn't you know, really meet them except glancingly. But in the books I've written since, it's something I've thought a lot about. I think you know, uh, you, the books you write come from a very particular point in your life. I couldn't really write Starter for 10 now or, or one day even. I, I'm not, uh, the, my preoccupations have changed and it just so happens that, especially with us and um, Sweet Sorrow, uh, I've thought a lot about it. And it isn't therapy, you know, you don't solve anything. Mm. You, don't, you don't come to any conclusions. You don't change the past. But, um, but uh, it does give you an opportunity to perhaps explore certain regrets that you have and, and go over certain things in a, in, a, in a contorted, altered, fictional way. I mean, I should emphasize there's none of my father in any of my books. At the same time, there's a lot of my um, preoccupation with that subject in, in both the books and the scripts, as you say. 
it's a very difficult relationship. I don't know anyone who has an easygoing, straightforward relationship with their parents, but um, it's something I do think about a lot. Do you, do you in part feel that your writing and exploration of some of these subjects is part of a journey towards trying to work out what it is you feel about some of these things? Does it feel like a journey towards finding answers about those things that are difficult in difficult relationships or things or things you might struggle with in yourself? Um, maybe they're certainly an exploration, but I don't know if they lead to any conclusion. You know, I don't think a work of fiction can be a kind of how to guide or, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it can be what you can sometimes do in a, in a story. You see it all the time in books and films, you know, the kind of I love you dad moment, the moment where there's some kind of resolution and some kind of rounding off of the story. And oh, well, we had these difficulties in the past, but we've some, come to some kind of moment of frankness and honesty and now everything is going to be fine. I don't believe those moments ever exist in the real world. When you write um, fiction or a screenplay, often you want to give the audience the satisfaction of of, of something like that, even if it's not as straightforward and, and unambiguous as that. Um, and definitely you can give a shape and uh, an exploration in, in fiction or film that you can't necessarily find in real life. So I, I think they're investigations rather than, um, rather than a, a, a sort of, yeah, a, a manual. And I, I find it, what you were saying about perhaps in your earlier books not going near those subjects do you think there is something in the process of every writer's thinking that that doesn't necessarily go towards a subject until they're ready to explore it and there's a sort of fear with some subjects that you're not quite you know in order to do really yeah. justice to something and be really honest and frank about it and present it in a way that's engaging there has to be part of yourself that is ready to open up doesn't there there has to be a kind of willingness to explore i suppose yeah i think so i think so though i think in the in, often the truth will seep out anyway not the truth but you know you're you're when i uh, this is a very quick story uh, um when i wrote start of a 10 i thought well you know he, he i don't want to write about parents and children so the dad's going to be dead in this one and so I kind of killed off the father before the action happens. And the father kind of, you know, he's there, he's referred to. And, and Brian, the central character, has feelings about his dead father, but he never really appears as a character. And I thought, well, that'll solve that problem. And my dad read the book and didn't say anything about it. And, and I thought, well, this is strange. He's, we're going to have to talk about it at some point. So I phoned him up one day and said, you know, it's all fiction. I, I hope you liked it, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a made up story. And he said, no, I understand that, but you didn't have to kill me. And um, <laughs> I laughed and he laughed and we never really talked about it again. And um, I think he knew that in not talking about something that the I'm going to use the word lacuna now without even know if it, knowing if it's the right word the things you skip are often as important as the things you delve into and sometimes by uh, dodging a subject you reveal another truth about it yeah I think that's really interesting and it's exactly the reflects the writing process as well doesn't it the best yeah. kind of writing that ability to be so confident in your writing, your process, that what you leave out, you are then confident that the reader will intuit from everything else that you have managed to leave in. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's one in Us where you know, there's a revelation about um, uh, Douglas's son in Us that comes, uh, that is, 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 is hugely significant to Douglas, but he, he mentions it in one sentence and then he moves on. And you hope that the fact that he doesn't talk about it, that, that even though it's a first person novel, mm -hmm. the fact that he mentions it and moves on still has a significance, even if you don't give him a long monologue mm -hmm. on the subject. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the gaps are as important as the, the things you make explicit. And um, so just uh, something else that makes a really, uh, I feel when I think of David Nichols, the author and screenwriter, I always think of you as the absolute master of, um, the use of time and flashback, both in structuring your stories and thematically as well. Um, 
And just going back to Sweet, sorry, there's this really, there's a beautiful and kind of resonant piece when Charlie first sees the brown pill bottles next to his dad's bed. And, and he says, you know, to most people, this would feel like hope, the beginning of a process towards my father getting better and taking these antidepressants. But I'd only seen people in the movies overdosed with them, feeling like the pill bottles are a loaded gun, a possibility of suicide on the table. And he says, and now this possibility joined the roster of terrors and anxieties that accompanied me through the night and on until morning. And it occurred to me then, then, just as it does now, that the greatest lie that age tells about youth is that it's somehow free of care, worry, or fear. Good God, doesn't anyone remember? And that, that to me felt like a real, um, the only time where there was a kind of almost um, a moment where where you were making this kind of very soul, soul felt point about nostalgia and the way that we look back at things and the way that we, nostalgia is about remembering things in the way we want to remember them. But there is often great pain in the reality of that. Um, and I just I want to kind of ask you about where, where, what you felt about nostalgia and how your approach to nostalgia has changed through your writing and how each one of those stories seems to deal with nostalgia in a very different way. Um, I mean, I'm quite defensive on the subject because I feel that uh, often nostalgia is sort of easy and sentimental and, 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 and either source of, you know, kind of cheap laughs when you, you, you look at old clothes and old music and there's a kind of fond embarrassment about how things were in the past. Um, or it can be rather cosy and sentimental. And, I don't long, you know, I wanted to write a book about the te someone's teenage years that wasn't sentimental or, or idealized, you know, that was about how lonely and frightening it can be. And often in later years, you look back and you think, what the hell was I worrying about? But in the moment, it's, it's, it's terrifying, you know, it's frightening. You worry about your parents, you worry about yourself. Loneliness is overwhelming. The pain of unrequited love is excruciating. Um, the fears and anxieties you have about the future are, are, are really powerful. And I wanted to write about that to maybe take some of the kind of um, larkiness off it. You know, it's set in the yeah. 90s and, and there's a danger that it's a sort of, you know, that you kind of write a kind of Blur versus Oasis kind of Spice Girls, larky nostalgia fest. And there is a bit of that and there's a bit of pleasure in that. But I wanted to write frankly about how difficult that time can be as well mm -hmm. and um, certainly I don't long for my 16th year again you know it's horrible <laughs> it's terrible in all kinds of ways um, and I'm, I suppose I when I sat down at, um, to think about whatever I might write next I thought well what you mustn't do is write anything said in the past you know you've got to engage with the present day and I think I will do that more in the future but um, I think a lot about the way Dickens in his novels, his novels are nearly, I mean, 75% of them are said in the past. People think of him as the great Victorian novelist, but he wasn't always, he was only occasionally writing about here and now in a documentary way. He was mainly writing about his childhood years and um, their period novels. And so maybe it's natural for us to want to kind of excavate those times, excavate our own, uh, our own youth, our own growing up and, and dig into it and, and, and analyze it. And, uh, and I don't know if that's nostalgia. Nostalgia to me, the word suggests something much warmer and um, softer. And I think it can be quite tough, that excavation. Um, I'm trying to think if that's true what I've said about Dickens, but I think it is true. Yeah, I mean, Great Expectations is a is a period novel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would find it very hard to write Sweet Sorrow now, you know, with the seventeen-year-old protagonist now. I think I could do it, and and maybe it would be a good would have been a good idea to do that to kind of do the research and talk to sixteen-year-olds and 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 and. Um, it isn't my 16th year. I wasn't 16 in 97, but I feel I do remember 97 and can write about it confidently in a way that I can't necessarily write about being a teenager now, certainly not in a first person voice. Mm -hmm. So it's natural, I think, for us to take a little step into the past to excavate it successfully. 
And I think, you know, moving on to us, for example, you deal with, um, <clears throat> well, you deal, let's not call it nostalgia, we'll look, call it mm. looking back, um, mm. at parental relationships, love, all of your kind of, all of the kind of really big key themes uh, are, are in there. And I think what's so, um, I feel like the opening chapters of us are a complete masterclass in the business of character conflict because you you use that kind of looking back um, as a way of really communicating so strongly uh, Douglas's, what Douglas's wife fell in love with about him mm. and set that against his kind of lack of awareness about some of the problems that, that she might then see in the kind of immutable, unchangeable parts of his character that might have started to grate. So all of that kind of... Yeah dispassionate and that that kind of slight lack of connection that she's somehow kind of gone off oh, for god's sake douglas and um and i think what's so wonderful about that is in those first couple of chapters which are very very poignant you're left kind of you're left with these kind of wonderful questions which are um my god how are you going to salvage this you're so unaware of what the problem is how are you going to salvage this marriage but at the same time you're also left kind of thinking but should you be changing yourself in the end like this is part of who you are and should you be changing yourself and in the balance of those opening chapters is a wonderful kind of truth and realism about you know marriage and where it can get to and and also the the absolute truth of looking back and two people being of a certain age and how they fell in love with each other it's a really brilliant combination of those things it feels like a really good marriage of all of those different themes and I was just it made me kind of wonder whether amidst a long amidst all of your books was there one that you felt you can emotionally connected to in a way that you know more so than the others really um I feel about I feel that the last three are a kind of trilogy I think of start of a ten and the understudy this is very pretentious to talk about my work like this but thank you for the nice, for the, for the kind words, I, I feel like Us and Sweet Sorrow on, on One Day are definitely more accomplished than the first two, which I'm fond of, but, but I think that, that, you know, they're the only funny ones. And one day I, I sort of hit my stride and, and, but with Us and Sweet Sorrow, I feel that they're a little bit more um, complicated and um, maybe more, yeah, I have more of a direct personal engagement with them, I suppose. One day was sort of a goodbye to all that. One day was about, you know, your 20s and 30s and parties and meeting people and, and beginning a life together. It was about my, yeah, my sort of, my, my solo years and that coming to an end. And us and Sweet Sour are much more concerned with family and parenthood and all of those things. And I suppose, um, but they're the, they're across the trilogy, they're all about love at different ages. You know, they're all about um, Sweet Sorrow starts at 16 and, and um, us, by the end, the protagonists are, are in their late 50s. So there's a little portrait of love at different times of, uh, of life, I suppose, across the three. But the last two I think of as a little pair. You know, they're both... Uh, the uh, Us is about a father setting out to rescue his son and part of Sweet Sorrow is about a son trying to save his father. Um, us is uh, about uh, how love dies and Sweet Sorrow is about our very first experience of it. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of, um, they're sort of bookends, I suppose, for the story in one day. Um, none of this is conscious. I'm just looking back and thinking about how they work. But always the book that, the most recent book, you know, if someone gave me the story now of one day, if one day hadn't been written and someone pitched me the story, I would probably say, yeah, not for me. You know, I couldn't write it yeah. now. Like, I, 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 my, my mind is elsewhere. I'm thinking about other things. I, and, um, and so the most recent book is always the one which most reflects your preoccupations and concerns. And, um, but I feel very fond of us and Sweet Sorrow. You know, I feel like um, the, 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 that I'd learned certain things by that stage as a writer and, and, and maybe was prepared to take more 
risks. I make it sound as if they're very experimental or dark novels. They're not, they're, they're not. But, um, but I felt like I enjoyed writing those two the most. And so do you feel like the next book that you write might in some way be another evolution from those starting points of Sweet Sorrow? Um, yeah, I think, that... I think there are um, things that I can't do anymore and shouldn't do anymore. You know, I've written a lot of terrible party scenes, parties going wrong. I'm going to have to stop doing that. I've written a lot about fathers and sons. I'm going to have to stop doing that. Uh, I've written a lot about kind of 20 year gap and how people change over 20 years. I'm going to have to stop doing that. So I feel like, um, and, and then at the same time, part of me thinks, well, you don't have to stop doing that. I mean, that's something that you can do and, and you enjoy writing about these themes. Why not explore them further? So there's always a tussle, I think, for writers at a certain point where, they, where uh, you have to, do you have to decide whether, I mean, does John Le Carre sit down and think, oh, I mustn't write another you know, disillusioned spy novel, <laughs> or does he embrace it? I don't know, I haven't quite worked it out yet. What's great for me is when I stop and do script work is I get to use other voices and write about other subjects. You know, I wouldn't have been able to write confidently myself on the subject of addiction and, uh, uh, and uh, recovery, but working on something like Patrick Melrose, you know, you're, you're given this wonderful material to, uh, to sculpt and shape, and that perhaps gives you confidence to, to take some of the ideas which interested you in the first place and, and expand on them in your own way. So that's why I'm, I'm very grateful to the books, other people's books, both as a reader and as a dramatist, because I think they've given me a certain confidence to go off in different directions. Mm -hmm. And I think the next book will have to be the beginning of something different. But what that's going to be, I, I have no idea at the moment. Absolutely none. I think I've got slightly caught in the trap of, of um, you know, all, the last three books have been a mixture of comedy and, and darker stuff. And, and uh, could I write a book that was pure comedy, you know, with no moments of melancholy or sadness or regret? I'm not sure that I could. And I simultaneously am aware that if I wrote something poetic and straight-faced and um, rather somber, that there'd be a certain amount of disappointment at the lack of jokes. Mm. So it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope, the, the desire to do something new without disappointing people. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. And can you see, can you ever imagine yourself writing a story that doesn't have love at the heart of it and all the hope and disappointment that is engendered in love as a subject? Um, more so now, yeah. I think more so now. I, I'm, I'm, um, when I was, when I was um, publicising Sweet Sorrow, I remember talking to a journalist who said, you know, what are you going to do next? And at that stage, I thought, well, maybe I need to go back to romantic comedy and write a really smart, funny, modern, urban rom-com. Just mm -hmm. kind of embrace it and go for it and write about two people falling in love. And the journalist looked at me and said, aren't you a bit old for that? And I suddenly thought, oh, maybe I am. I maybe, you know, certainly there are there are um, there are whole codes of behaviour and etiquettes and and uh, you know the whole business of online dating and the way the internet has changed how we meet people. All of that that I know nothing about. Does that mean that the subject is beyond my understanding? I don't think so. I think I can still write about it. But does it preoccupy me in in a way? that's necessary for you to spend two or three or four or five years with the story. I, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure. I'll have to give that some thought. Mm. We should, let's talk about screenwriting, which is um, fascinating. So I'm married to a screenwriter and we yeah. have these ongoing debates about um, uh, what it takes to approach each one of those disciplines and how much white, pe white, <laughs> white there is on the page of a screenwritten yeah. page. Um, <clears throat> To how, how, A, has the process of screenwriting changed the more that you've done it? Um, and do you, how does the process of fitting, so take us, for example, which is mm. about to come out. Um, 
in those early chapters where you have all of that really rich detail about characterization, distilling that into such an economical form of screenwriting is, I imagine, enormously challenging. Do you feel like you have got more used to it? How do you approach it? And how do you feel about it? I've got a bit better at knowing what won't work. You know, quite often when you start the process, you, you, people have read the book and they've given their responses and often they'll say, oh, I can't wait to see that scene. Or I love that moment when. And then you, you, you pick up the book and you try and convert it into this different form and it isn't funny or it doesn't make sense or it's unnecessary or it's, it's facetious or, you know, that, 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 that certain, or it's too big. That, 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 that things that work on the page often really just aren't going to work on screen. And I still make mistakes along those lines. I still often will insist on a line of dialogue or, or an encounter or a scene that actually, when you're in the edit, suddenly does to appear to be superfluous or over the top or uh, hitting a point too hard. You know, um, you have to be very nimble in screenwriting. You have to make your point and then move on. Whereas um, in a novel, it's fine to explore an idea, to explore a reaction, to, to um, explore why a character feels or thinks in a particular way. Um, on screen, um, the actor will give you something on top of the line and often that will do the job of two or three or four pages of prose. So that is something that I'm constantly discovering. Um, uh, the biggest loss is, um, you know, an, the inner monologue. Often you'll read, uh, with us in particular, you know, it's a first person voice and the voice is very strong and very distinctive. And he says and think, he thinks a lot of funny things that he can never, ever, ever possibly say. You know, if, if Douglas makes an observation, a private observation about someone at a dinner table, no one says that stuff out loud. So you just have to be ruthless and put a line through it and move on. And often if you strip out, you know, the natural instinct when you adapt a, a chapter for the screen is to just underline all the dialogue and pick the best bits. That doesn't work either. You know, often there'll be repetition or it'll, it'll seem... Um, slow moving because a, a dialogue has to have a structure. You know, characters have to meet and know each other's names and establish the relationships and all of that stuff has to be put into speech. And that can make um, a very nimble scene on the page into something quite slow moving on the screen. So all of this is, is an ongoing process and um, very demanding, something that is, can work really well uh, but is is often never without completely re without regret. At which point you have to remind yourself that it doesn't stop existing. You know, if you don't put it into the screenplay, the book is still on the shelf, and that the experiences are always going to be different. There's no such thing as an entirely faithful adaptation. There are degrees of fidelity, but but the only way to get the true experience of a book is to read a book what you'll get from a screen version are all kinds of other pleasures of music, of performance, of physical comedy, of design, of landscape, um, of editing, you know, all that other stuff, which is great as well. And I love uh, the two, but they're an entirely different set of tools and you have to work out which one to use in which instance. And um, presumably which one uh, you you are drawn to at the time? Do you have moments where you feel much more like writing prose than words for the screen? Uh, I, um, the experience, the actual experience of writing prose, mm. for me is more, when it's going well, is bliss. Mm. You know, it's really lovely when you hit your stride. I, I don't know if you have this experience as well, but when you feel that you know what the story is, you know who the characters are, and it's just a case of transcribing the thing that exists in your head. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And screenwriting is never without a certain amount of tension and anxiety and the notes just drag you down. I'm, I mean, it's the, the, there are definitely times where you think, how come I have all this authority as a novelist, but you don't trust me as a screenwriter? That's, that's a common experience. Mm -hmm. And you have to just, 
hush that voice because that's the nature of the job. You've got to collaborate with people mm-hmm. and you have to trust them and respect them because that's, that's the work. So David, I, we've got a few more minutes left. I've got two yeah. more questions. Uh, is there a book that you would really like to adapt at the moment? That's an interesting question. And it's one, I'm always a bit wary of, of saying it in case you, know, you blab about something. There are, there are a couple. I'm trying to do less adaptation because I feel like I need to, you know, it feels like cheating. You're copying someone else's homework, really. They've done the difficult stuff. There's a book I've always loved, which I've tried to work out how to put on screen, and that's um, Hangover Square by Patrick Hamilton, which is an amazing book, I think. But it has a, a, a problem at the center of it that's very, very hard to put on screen. But the actual atmosphere of the book, the sense of, of um, evil in it and malevolence and the, the brilliance of the plot is really appealing to me so i i would be a, a departure for me but it's a book i really really love mm-hmm. and i've never quite worked out how to do it so but hangover square hasn't quite gone away and my final question is professionally speaking what keeps you awake at night well we're about to have something on television and that is really frightening I mean, it just is. It is. Because while I, you know, I really love it. It's really good, I think. I'm very proud of it. But, um, but no show is universally loved. And, um, and it's much harder to dodge responses now. You know, you used to just be able to look at the reviews the day after and then get on with your life. And now uh, the work never, the reviews never really stop. You know, they never go away. So it's both incredibly exciting and a great privilege to have something on TV but also um, it's, it's undeniably stressful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I do lose sleep over that. And I also lose sleep over just keeping going. You know, I, I, I feel like um, that, that question, has the well run dry? Am I just going to repeat myself for the next 20, 30 years? You know, does worry me. Uh, and, uh, you know, how can I stay fresh and do I have to, or can I just can I just um, explore these themes forever? I, I I don't know. It's a it's a tricky one. I, keeping going is is a worry as well. You have been an amazing interviewee, David Nichols. Thank so, you. It's a pleasure. That, guys, this is in all good bookshops, and uh, us is going to be out on the BBC imminently. Thank you so much for being interviewed by us. It's been brilliant. Oh, I hope it's been okay. It's been very nice to talk to you. Thank you for, for all the kindness. It's been, it's been lovely to talk.